this is the postgraduate pediatric orthopedic video series. I'm Satana Shreit, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. In a previous video uh, by Dr. Mohamed Qinawi, he took us through an overview of a gait analysis and various parts of a gait analysis report. I also took you through the gait patterns in children with hemiplegic uh, type cerebral palsy. In this video, we'll take you through the gait patterns in children with diaplegic cerebral palsy. And as I mentioned, these videos are based on the famous book of gait analysis and cerebral palsy, which was published by Dr. James Gage over 20 years ago. But I also I refer you to this uh, paper by the Australian group, which is the sagittal gait patterns in children with spastic diaplegia, in which they identified uh, five distinctive type of gait patterns. And in this video, we'll go through each type in more detail. In a similar way to a, a hemiplegic type cerebral palsy, the deformity usually gets worse from distal to proximal as the severity of cerebral palsy gets increased. So in a group 1 diaplegic cerebral palsy, the first pattern is a true quinus, in which there is limited ankle dorsiflexion on the affected limb. In the second group uh, of diaplegic cerebral palsy, or what is called the jump gate group, uh, there's still a true contracture of the ankle joint, but also there's contracture of the knee joint. And this is because of the tightness of the hamstring and rectus femoris muscle. Sometimes the psoas might be contracted, but usually not. In the third group, or the group that's called apparent equinus, there's a knee flexion contracture because of the hamstring and rectus femoris muscle contracture. And also there's a femoral hip flexion contracture because of the psoas muscle, but there's no true gastroceleus contracture. But here the child is forced to walk on their toes because of the hip and knee contractures. In the group number four are the true grouch gait, in which there is ankle dorsiflexion, there's knee flexion contracture, and there's hip flexion contracture. And in the final group, or group five, uh, which is the asymmetric gait. In this group, uh, one side has a certain type, one of the types that we mentioned, and the other one is a different type. For example, apparent equinus on one side and jump gait on the other side. And now let's focus on the uh, first group, which is a group one, uh, where the children have a true equinus. The ankle dorsiflexion is limited and the child walks on their toes, as you can see in this video. As they stand on their toes, they lost the first and the second rocker, and there's hyperextension on the near stance face because of the ankle knee coupling. The hip itself is usually normal, but usually the child tends to lean their pelvis forward to bring their center of gravity forward. And when we look on their kinematic charts, uh, by the way, this, this kinematic chart is not for the child in particular, but as a group uh, in general, depending on the severity of the quinus, usually the range of the ankle is in the negative side and hardly they hardly reach the a neutral the knee usually there's hyperextension in the stance face and the hip usually with the normal but there is usually anterior pelvic tilt you may have also noticed there's significant in towing uh, of both lower limbs but this is usually not visible in the sagittal views but it will be visible in the axial views and as far as uh, treatments are concerned Hinge AFOs are useful for the children and they are usually better than solid AFOs because they dampen the ankle knee or uh, couplings. And when the gastro are short, trial of Botox, serial casting and physiotherapy to, uh, to lengthen these muscles non-surgically. But these fails, of course, gastric lengthening can be considered, but it's really very important for uh, these children should be fully assessed because hitting contractures and other abnormalities in different parts of the limbs are common. Now let's move to group 2, which is the jump gait group. Here, there's true quinus deformity of the ankle because of the tightness in the gastro muscles, but also there's a knee flexion contracture because of the tightness in the hamstring and rectus muscles. And when you look at these children, they usually walk on their toes and they lose their first, first and second rockers. And even the third rockers usually shorten if it's not completely disappeared. If you look at the knee, there's usually knee flexion through the whole gait cycle, 
And if you look at the hip, usually the hip and it flex. In fact, they hardly reach a full extension. And the pelvis is tilted forward. And now let's look at the kinematic chart to see whether they match. If you look at the bottom chart, which is the ankle, you can see the black area, which is where the ankle range of motion is. Most of the time it is in the quinus range. And if you look at the knee graph, you can see uh, the knee range usually in flexion range as well but the movement between the maximum flexion and maximum extension has been reduced as well if you look at the hip uh, there's uh, more flexion through the gait cycle than normal in fact the hip does not reach full extension at all when we look at the pelvic charts we can see the typical double bump appearance and this reflects the tightness in the, in the hamstring or the rectus where every step it causes the pelvic tilted in one direction. And as far as the treatments are concerned, uh, similar to type 1 or to group 1, hinge AFOs are more useful than solid AFOs, uh, but also all these muscles need to be stretched using Potox, uh, serial casting, or physiotherapy. And when they are still in the spastic places, uh, SDR can be a good choice as well for these patients. Uh, if they reach to the contracture level, then these need to be lengthening in single event multilevel surgery after full assessment. Now we move to the group of three, which is the upper antiquinus group. And these children, uh, although they work on their toes, similar to group two, but there's no true quinus deformity of the ankle. But these children are forced to walk on their toes because of the fixed flexion deformity of the knee and the fixed flexion deformity of the hip. Clinically, they don't have equinus, and this is how we differentiate them from group two. Uh, treatment of this group and uh, treatment of the next group, which is a crouch gait, is far more complex than the first two groups, and we devoted a special video uh, about treating these conditions, which will be published soon. And this uh, takes us to group four, which is the crouch gait group. Here, there's ankle dorsiflexion, particularly in the stance phase. There's uh, knee flexion for the gait cycle and there's hip flexion for the gait cycle. When we examine the kinematic charts, this is reflected very well. In the bottom chart, as you can see, the ankle and dorsiflexion, not only in the stance phase, but also in the swing phase. In the knee area, although the range of motion has been limited, but it has been flexed through the whole gait cycle. And similarly can be said uh, about the hip. Uh, the pelvic is not tilted here. And now we completed the four distinctive patterns of uh, diaplegic cerebral palsy. We left with group five, which is asymmetric type. In this type, uh, the two uh, lower limbs behave differently. One could be with the jump gate and the other one could be crouch or any other combination of uh, these uh, patterns. Uh, for the kinematic charts, again, they display distinctive features. In a group one, uh, the ankle is one in equinus. Uh, the knee is little affected, sometimes we can get hyperextension with the hip uh, usually normal and the pelvis might be tilted forward. Uh, with the group 2, which is the jump gait type, the, knee in uh, the ankle is in equinus, the knee usually in flexion. In chondrotic shift to group 1 where we get hyperextension, the hip in a slight flexion as well. Uh, for group 3, which is the apparent equinus, uh, we usually find the knee and the hip reflection by the ankle, although they stand on their toes, and sometimes we can get some reflection on the kinematic chart, usually the clinical examination differentiate between these two things. Group 4, which is a crouch gait, there's ankle dorsiflexion, hip and knee flexions. If you look at the bottom of the chart, uh, clearly the ankle and dorsiflexion, while the knee in uh, flexion is through the whole gait cycle. The hip is a flex as well in most of the cycles, while the pelvic usually with the normal or sometimes can be uh, tilted anteriorly. Uh, as far as the treatment is concerned, uh, group 3 and group 4 uh, and group 5 usually require a thorough assessment before advising any treatment plan. Uh, and it's not a good idea to, uh, to give a plan based on surgical assessment only or uh, gait patterns only. And this will be the subject of a future video, which we hope will release shortly. Now we hope we cover the basic of gait analysis. We also went through the typical patterns that we see uh, in hemiplegic type and diaplegic cerebral palsy. 
and we really hope these will help you to better understand this condition and help you pass the exam easier. Thank you.